You are listening to episode 27 of the R Podcast. Hello, everyone. It is great to be talking to you again. And this is episode 27 of the Art Podcast. And this is the second of a three part series of my insights and takeaways and conversations from the 2019 Art Studio Conference that took place last month. First, a big thank you to everybody that sent some great feedback and wonderful comments on the last episode, which, um, if you didn't listen to it, that was an awesome episode where I was able to chat with Nick Tierney and Hillary Parker, who are also fellow podcast hosts. So I want to thank them again for the great conversation in that last episode. Um, Today, I have a really awesome conversation with Rich Ioni, who is now a software engineer at our studio. And we'll get to that shortly. But first, I wanted to share some of my thoughts from being on the other side, so to speak, at the R Studio conference, because I was very fortunate to be able to give a talk about, in this case, effective use of shiny modules. So before I get to some of my insights from that, I want to mention that as of about a week, as I'm recording this ago, all of the recordings from each talk are now available online at the R Studio website. And we'll certainly put a link to that in the show notes, but Needless to say, the moment those recordings came out, I first of all, this is much faster than they did in previous years. So kudos to the team for making this happen so quickly. Um, but yes, I have been watching the heck out of them, as they say. I've All the ones that I couldn't attend, I've hit those first. And even the ones I did attend, but I wanted to hear again, I've watched those too. And basically, every talk is awesome. So there's there's no lemons here, so to speak. They are all really well done. And I think in the next episode, I'll give my takeaways on kind of the overall feel of that. Um, but I definitely um, was interested in a lot of the shiny co- uh, content. So I'll get to my talk in a little bit, and I'll talk about some of the other talks after mine that really um, got my attention. So yeah, this was easily, in terms of my talk, the biggest audience I've ever spoken in front of <laughs> by a landslide. Um, but, and I would say that this wasn't like my first conference talk ever. I've done a, a couple others at more of the statistical conferences, like the Joint Statistical Meetings or JSM for short, and some little niche conferences here and there. And then last year, I was actually fortunate enough to speak at the first ever Art and Pharma conference, which was held in Boston uh, last summer. And I actually gave a talk about kind of use of shiny in production and some of my, you might say, a a potpourri or a collection of advice along the way. Well, I've been using shiny for a long time, and I feel like it's definitely matured enough that I think in using it the right way, so to speak, you can really make a production grade application. And maybe that wasn't the case when it first came out. And truthfully, it wasn't, at least in my case. But I think now that that myth of shiny is only good for prototyping and we can you have to go to something like Python Flask or whatever else for production. I kind of think those days are over. And I want to first uh, credit Joe Chang, of course, the author of Shiny, but he really set the stage about this both um, at the R and Pharma conference last year, but also his keynote at our studio conference when he went through an awesome example of an application that he assessed, you know, with load testing and what are some of the best practices and um, issues to consider when you start scaling your application up to a a massive audience and what are some of the other issues you need to think about. So 
I've been thinking a lot of these same things, albeit I'm thinking more of the situation, you might say, from a development side of things, how to make it, how to make the development process of an application more effective and what are some principles we should follow. So I had proposed an idea for such a talk. And of course, I am extremely lucky and extremely fortunate that this resonated with Joe. And I'm going to take this time now. And I frankly should have done this after my talk, but I was, believe me, the emotions were pretty high during the talk. Um, but he has been an immense help. Like he has been so gracious of his time to help me prepare for this. And I'll get to, you know, some of the actual, you know, tangible things he was able to let me learn and, and let me focus on. But just as a person and as a wonderful colleague in terms of preparing for this, I can't thank Joe enough. I'm not sure if he listens to this, but if he does, Joe, you are supremely awesome, not only on your technical ability, but also just as, as a person and being, you know, again, generous of your time, patient with a lot of my probably silly questions in the beginning about modules in general, but you have walked me through that. You've, again, the patience and the generosity you've shown with your time um, has, been, has been just awesome. So... A lot of times in the past when I would see these kind of talks, whether at our studio conference or at USAR or even some of the other um, lower scale conferences, I've always been fascinated on what kind of effort did it take or what were some of the principles that the speakers use to prepare for such talks. And and like I mentioned at the conference this year, every, everyone was really well done. You can tell a lot of preparation took place. And I, I won't kid myself, I certainly don't measure up to a lot of them, but I do want to share with you before we get to our conversation with Rich, um, some of the ideas and practical things I did to help prepare myself in hopes that if you're in a situation where you're given a highly, um, you know, a conference talk or maybe a, a talk at work that has a big audience, these are some of the things that helped me out. Um, so this really started shortly after I submitted that proposal, and you might say even at that conference last summer at the R and Pharma conference, but um, the first step to preparing for this, once I knew this was really happening, was to really align on what are the key messages I want to get across in this talk, because time limits dictate how much you can say, but another principle to help me along this way, um, Joe mentioned to me quite early on, and a thought that's also been echoed by David Robinson in his keynote is that these talks are in essence sort of like an advertisement, but you're advertising maybe an idea or a methodology or a principle, and you know you can't cover everything about those. But if you can cover the main points and give them places where they can follow up on or find other examples that put this in practice, that resonates better with people than if you try to shoehorn every single concept of, for instance, in my case, every little detail about modules, it just isn't going to work because it's, it's not going to be retained as well as if you have a few key points, you reinforce them in different ways, but you, you have examples to draw from. So early on in this process, I was, again, fortunate enough to talk to Joe about this quite a bit. But we, we narrowed down some key principles that we could highlight in this talk with the expectation that this was not the end story, that there would be more material to come, so to speak. So what material am I talking about in this case? Well, whether you're doing a shiny app or you're doing like a workflow example or an innovative analysis, examples really speak heavily with audiences or they resonate the most. So in this case, we tried to figure out what can we do from a application that isn't like the cookie cutter application that you see on some of the shiny gallery examples or they're just like demonstrating a single function, a single UI element, something like that. But you're in, instead trying to show, in my case, how modules, if you construct them with the right principles in mind, can lead to a very streamlined workflow and establish the connections between pieces of your application. So it was 
actually, before I even made the slides, we worked on this example. And <laughs> I'll go on a little uh, soapbox moment here. I knew right away the last thing I was going to do is another MT cars example. <laughs> um, you know, I'm I'm getting a little tired of that data set, so I'm, I wanted to do something different. And actually, at that conference last summer, uh, or may have been another talk that Max Kuhn had done, um, he talked about an, an, a housing data set from Ames, Iowa, here in the United States. And I thought, hmm, maybe that's something worth, worth looking into. So I downloaded that package, I exported the data, and I was thinking, hey, this, this, I could do something with this. So then I figured out, okay, I got my data, what kind of insights do I want to convey in this application, but yet show how modules play a key role here. So then, of course, what things do when people look at an app uh, analysis result or an application want to see the most? Visualizations usually at the top of the list. So I put a couple scatter plots in there, letting the user choose which variables to select. And then based on those selections, they could also highlight certain points in that and be able to get a table down below the plots that show more of the other characteristics of those observations, i.e. some more variables in that data set specifically for those points. Now, I'm not going to get into too much more detail here because honestly, the talk and the example cover the rest of that. But once I got that example in place and I worked on the modules inside it, the messages started to kind of hit home with me better than if I just try to do the slides first and then do some example afterwards. So. I feel like if you can, find your use case or your demonstration first, and then you'll be better off with constructing your, your narrative or your message around the talk, you know, to really um, tie in with that example. Um, so then it was the case of I started developing the slides, um, trying to mix some, you know, some personal kind of anecdotes, some little humorous pieces too. You don't want just a wall of text. I think a lot of people know that. So I broke it up with some pictures, some kind of areas on the slides that really hit home the key points. And there was even one part of the talk where I almost become an authoritative, I won't say dictator, but I was pretty stern about a message that if you don't follow these principles I'm talking about, it's simply not good enough. And I'm not the type of person that feels comfortable saying it like that. But Joe reassured me that this is something that's been so difficult to teach people about with modules that don't be afraid to be authoritative here because we need this message. Even in the trainings that the, of like the shiny workshops that have taken place previously, modules have been one of the most difficult concepts to convey. So this was really a first step to getting these other messages across and don't be shy about it. And admittedly, I'm not comfortable with that sometimes, but after some practice and again, some good coaching from Joe, I was able to hopefully get that message across pretty loud and clear. Um, but yeah, it's, it's being confident in what you're speaking about and knowing the material. Sometimes we've all been there. Sometimes we do a presentation and we know most of it, but we have to kind of gloss over some details and we cross our fingers and no one's going to ask about it, right? <laughs> for this one, I made sure I knew exactly what I was talking about. And if I didn't know, well, again, I had the luxury of talking to Joe about this, but who, however you're, you're um, preparing your talk, you know, run it by some thought leaders in your domain and really get those questions answered so that you have confidence in what you're talking about. It's kind of easier said than done. Sometimes I feel like, oh, is this a very stupid question kind of thing? But be be comfortable in asking because if you don't ask, it can actually sometimes lead to worse things than if you do try to clear things up first. So, so that those those ideas are very helpful. F getting em enough slides, or I should say, not doing too much slides for a twenty minute talk is a bit of a challenge. And I did have to cut out some of the material, but I was able to interject some real you know, mishaps that occurred for me when I was first using modules and some shortcuts I took. And even though on the surface, it didn't quite fit with the rest of the narrative in terms of the principles I was talking about, it was also good to tell people one use case of what not to do 
to show that I can learn from it. And I hope that from my experience, everybody listening to this that's going to build Shiny modules in their applications won't go through the same thing I did, or at least it'll minimize their, their pain points. So by the time I got through the material, I did have enough time for questions. I was very thankful for that. Um, but I, I'll, I'll tell you, I don't know if anybody listening was in the audience during my talk, but the nerves really started to hit about, I would say five minutes before the, 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 the start time. And I remember very clearly, I'm kind of standing up there looking at the screen, starting to see the people fill in. And it's like the heart's racing a bit, kind of take deep breaths. And Joe comes up to me and says, so are you ready? Something to that effect. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> he was like, it's okay. Take a deep breath. Think about, you know, the material and be, be confident and look at how many people want to hear this message. And that can be a double edged sword sometimes because you're like, Oh man, I got so many people in the audience. But at the same time, it's like, well, they really want to hear this. So let's, let's knock this out. Let's do this. So I think after about 10 seconds after my intro, my practice rehearsals really paid off in that, at that point. And even that night before, this leads me to my next point, practice the heck out of it. <laughs> I practiced that thing probably seven times that night before the talk and definitely before that as well. But I even forego going to their little concert that they had arranged because I wanted to make this my best effort that I could. And I won't lie, I've been looking forward to something like this for a very, very long time. I've kind of, I'm not sure if I said it as clearly before, but I've kind of felt like I've been in the shell, so to speak, of not being able to share some of my insights, either through work reasons or life reasons. And this was kind of like a, a showcase of these are some things I have learned, but I want all of you to benefit and hopefully get some ideas that can help you out. It's my way of giving back. And I've been such a consumer of R and all the awesome packages that have transformed my workflow for all the right reasons that I want to start relaying some of the best things I've learned while acknowledging I'm certainly not a master, but just passing along what I've done to hopefully have this this newer generation of data scientists and statisticians and developers that are learning this awesome language, giving them some points to consider, but some resources to help them along that journey. Hence why the podcast is a thing too. But I, and needless to say, I'm just saying that I've been wanting an opportunity like this for a while and the, it came together at the right point for me because I think I was finally ready for it. Probably, I probably wasn't ready for it before. But now I think I've been through a few experiences. I've done some, you know, production-like work at, at, at the day job and done some pretty innovative things. But now I'm trying to take pieces of that without, you know, of course, breaking any confidentiality or other pr uh, procedures, but trying to relay some best practices. So I think this was my first real crack at that. And that's why I wanted to practice this so much because I wanted to make sure that it, I didn't waste the opportunity because you never know when these opportunities come. So you got to be ready for it, so to speak. So after the talk is over, we have the Q and a and the moment that literally almost took me out of my shoes, so to speak, is when someone had asked a question, <laughs> I'm still laughing about this. He said, this is completely off topic, but boy, I love your podcast. When are you going to start doing it again? And I was like, <laughs> I almost fell out of my boots or shoes there, but it's just so gratifying to see that people enjoy listening to this, but hopefully they're learning something from it. So it's just more motivation to keep it going this time. But that was kind of, as I'm decompressing from the experience, that was a nice little uh, unexpected bonus there. But um, so whoever asked that, thank you. And I hope that you'll enjoy these new episodes. But but yeah, I've gotten awesome feedback from the, from the audience. Um, Two people in particular gave me some nice shout outs on Twitter. Um, Ian Little, previous guest of the show, uh, really um, talented, shiny developer. And also someone who gave a great poster that I unfortunately didn't have a chance to talk with that detailed. Uh, Nick Strayer, he's a PhD candidate at Vanderbilt. 
he gave me some nice uh, tweets back about the, sh- the modules and how important they are. But I'll put a link in, his, in the show notes to his poster because they, it is a fantastic poster about looking at kind of genetic phenotyping biomarker data in a way that Shining can make exploring that so much easier. So, Nick, that was awesome. And I hope we can cross paths and really get talk again more detail next time because you, you've done some awesome work with Shiny. And speaking of modules, both Ian and Nick have written our packages in, that are, of course, on the community um, that use modules. So Ian has done a package called Shiny Pod, which was in the very early days of modules. And then Nick has done a package called Shiny Sense, which has some nice little um, utilities for even recording audio from a Shiny app or swiping things. And it, but even... The, the coolest part is if you have a mobile phone with an accelerometer, it has connections to get some of that data out. I don't know how he pulled it off, but that's that's slick stuff. But they're really well done packages and well done uses of modules. So someone also asked in my in my talk afterwards if I've done packages with modules. And while I haven't yet, these two are great examples to follow. So I'll have links to both of those in, in the notes as well. But another one I want to acknowledge is uh, Colin Fay. Um, I met him for the first time, and he had an excellent poster about using building what he calls big shiny apps in a production setting. The poster has so many principles that I am like, yes, I am so glad you're saying that. I have thought so many similar things, and he articulated it so well. And he had he his, his poster is really well done. So I'll have a link to that as well. So I guess in closing, I'll say that all the preparation really paid off. And yes, you can't always prevent nerves, so to speak, in front of this kind of setting. But if you practice well, if you're confident about your message and you you know where to be authoritative, but you don't try to cram too much into that time slot, you want to leave the audience with something that they can go to afterwards and see the principles you're talking about in action. So hopefully I did a, you know, a, an adequate job of it. But again, it was an awesome experience to be on that other side for the first time. And the other talks right after me were so awesome. Um, Alan Dipper talked about React.js, which I'm definitely going to be uh, be looking at more closely. And um, um, Barrett, had done a nice talk about the reactive log, which is getting a huge um, facelift, so to speak. And then um, the the other talk was about using messaging between uh, Shiny module, between Shiny processes, actually our processes within a Shiny application. Um, Ian Fellows, yeah, that, that's the name. Sorry, I was blanking on it for a second. But yeah, I'm going to check out his IPC package as well. So Again, awesome content of the conference overall. I'll have a link to the recording's website, as well as an awesome resource from Carl Broman, who himself gave a great talk, but he's put on GitHub kind of like an index page of links to all the talks, all the recordings, all the slides, all the speaker bios or social profiles, and even follow-up blog posts afterwards. So it's a great kind of one-stop shop to find all these resources available. So... Uh, hope you enjoy watching all that because I certainly have. So I've I've probably talked enough. I want to now um, highlight my conversation with a brilliant software engineer at our studio. He is doing some awesome things that you'll be hearing about right now in my conversation with Rich Eon. Welcome back, everybody. Um, we're at our studio conference, and day two of the workshops has ended, and the main event begins. But before um, I'm going to the reception, I have the very the, uh, great pleasure of welcoming somebody I've followed in the community for quite a while, has wrote some really awesome packages, in particular a diagrammer, and that's certainly not the only one. But that's when I first uh, met and uh, first heard about the work of my guest, uh, Rich Ioni. Yeah, Rich, hey. thank you very much for joining thanks for me. Being here. Hey, thanks for having me. I yeah, say. 
Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's great well, to be here. Great, great. Yeah, welcome, welcome. So um, for our listeners who are not familiar with your work, um, why don't you give them a little bit of a background on how you guys started using R and how yeah. you wound up at our studio? Yeah, it's a crazy story. Uh, well, I started doing something totally different, like so many others have. Uh, I started in atmospheric science. Uh, that was uh, what I was meant to do, I suppose. Uh, but <laughs> it's not what I ended up doing. Uh, now I'm working for our studio. Um, so how did I get there? Um, well, I started using R, for one. Um, I was using my in my work projects. Um, hard to explain. Like, I, I started using it. I did, <laughs> I think it was back in 2010, 2011. I'm not really sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I started using it in my work projects just on a whim. I've heard about it. Um, started using it, and I didn't stop. Uh, <laughs> it was just so uh, so refreshing compared to what I've been using before, which is scientific software or just Excel. Oh, um, yes. uh, yeah. Unfortunately, we've all been there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I kept using Excel for a bit longer, but the transition was pretty fast to never using Excel really for work again. Mm-hmm. Um, everything just switched to R scripts, um, you know, like great plots, uh, reproducibility there was so many advantages Mm -hmm. Uh, you know the learning curve was kind of there but um, you know I just kept at it and uh, eventually uh, with less time spent in Stack Overflow (laughs) searching for every little thing in R (laughs) that I didn't know Um, so yeah I started making uh, R packages uh, mostly focused toward uh, solving you know problems in atmospheric modeling Mm -hmm. Uh, then I started to get more general and um I really geared my package development towards trying out new things, um, like having a different, you know, subject. So just so I would learn more things and grow a bit in terms of uh, learning R. Nice. Yeah, yeah, it was it was quite good, and uh, I was able to spend quite a bit of work time. Um, I, I convinced people at work that uh, this was a good thing to do, and so I was able to do a lot of R development on their dime. Uh, which I hope helped everybody else out. And it was certainly great for practice. Mm-hmm. And uh, eventually I started making more general packages that appeal to more, to more people. Um, I, I guess a uh, pretty large one is the, the diagrammer package. Oh yes, we gotta yeah. talk about that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I worked on that a bit. Um, other ones too for solving problems. Any package I wrote was for solving some problem at work or some, some itch I had to scratch. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I just kept going. I didn't stop. And uh, so here I am today. <laughs> wow. Well, it's, I'm sure there's a lot to that journey. Um, now, I will be, I'll be completely candid with you. When I was familiar with, of course, Diagrammer, and yeah. to, I'll, I'll speak for myself. Um, so when I had first um, was familiar work with Diagrammer, I was convinced that you had a background in like graphic design or design principles because you have by far some of the best documentation in terms of you know, the aesthetics of it and the organization of it that I have seen in throughout the community. I don't know. I, I mean, I'm just impressed with what you've been doing with that package. It is just immense from the documentation level and, of course, the capabilities of it. So yeah. you, you mentioned you, it was probably informed by some work projects or work-related things you had to do. Yeah. Tell us more about how you got started with Diagrammer. Yeah, um, it was actually during Christmas, a Christmas break. Um, <laughs> I, I saw I was searching around for something exactly that, like creating a, some sort of simple diagram in R. Mm-hmm. Uh, before that, I was doing everything uh, through like OmniGraffle for any sort of figures. It's, okay. a, it's a Mac application. Sure, uh, it's really good. And um, I eventually wanted to sort of like make something just like that that mm-hmm. was text based out of uh, out of R. Um, so yeah, yeah, I sort of started from that, uh, and, and at that point, HTML widgets was a thing, I think. Um, okay. I sort of heard about it, but I didn't think about using it. Uh, and um, yeah, and, and I think it was Kent Russell, who, um, who's also, who goes by the, 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 the handle Tally Portfolio. Yes, yeah. he's an awesome, Everybody awesome guy. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. He sort of helped me sort of get on the road to uh, making that HTML widget. Essentially, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I made something like a fake HTML widget to yep. start with, sort of like the, the hard way. Yeah, sure. Because uh, it was based on a JavaScript library. And, and mm-hmm. yeah, eventually helped me sort of widgetize it. And uh, it just kept going from there. And wow. uh, people liked it. So I just kept working on it. 
Yeah, yeah. That, that's awesome that you would use these opportunities to you know, learn something new. Yeah. But at the same time, you definitely persevere. I'm sure it wasn't easy in the beginning to learn these frameworks. And, yeah, yeah. But, but I'm really impressed with everything you've done there. Yeah, yeah. tough going. A lot of Googling and uh, yep. just a lot of you know trial and error stuff. But uh, yeah. yeah, eventually it sort of panned out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, why don't you, you tell us a bit about uh, an effort I think is fairly recent to you, um, definitely a departure from Diagrammer, yeah. uh, the package called GT for yeah. making tables. So tell us a little bit about um, what your scope is there and what your plans are. Yeah, yeah. I, I related this to somebody else when I, uh, I think last night I had a talk in the lobby uh, about mm -hmm. how this started. And uh, my fuzzy recollection is there was a, a Google document uh, circulating around uh, our studio, uh, something about projects that need to be done. Mm -hmm. And one of them was grammar of tables or just something like that. Sure. Uh, and it was essentially was making tables. Uh, but I, th I think the emphasis there was having a simple, um, a very simple API that's very direct to, to create tables. Because of course, there's tons of table making packages in R. That, it's almost uh, overwhelming to be yeah, honest. So what, yeah. Why, yeah, so why do one more? Uh, <laughs> I guess the, 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 the change would be, or the, the thing that we bring to the table is it's easier to use. Um, okay. And I, I hope that we somewhat accomplish that. Um, so, so yeah, so GT is a table making package and uh, allows you to very simply um, construct a table based on some data frame or table and it allows you to specify uh, what goes in certain parts, and we sort of outline what those parts are. You mm -hmm. can use them or not use them. And uh, it does a lot of things, a lot of the hard things for you, like, um, like organizing footnotes, allowing you to you know, choose how to format your footnotes in general, um, how to structure your table, how to order uh, the rows and also the columns, uh, things like that. And also we, we have different export types, like mm -hmm. HTML. Uh, PDF by way of LaTeX, mm -hmm. and RTF is uh, sort of like the, the three output formats that we want to support. I, uh, I have a backstory about RTF. Um, we may or may not talk about it here. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. RTF is uh, an eye-opener if you haven't really uh, used it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's, um, it's fun to program, yes. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Uh, I don't know if you're being facetious or not, but that <laughs> is so, yeah. um, a cryptic uh, format that I've had to deal with for some work stuff. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, the it, the strange strange thing about RTF is there's not a whole lot of uh, examples or uh, things to lead on in terms of documentation. Yeah, I think there's one pretty influential book. There's also um, a spec that's available online, but mm -hmm. other than that, you're kind of on your own to experiment, which yep. it's both good and bad, I suppose. Yeah, and but you know, I'm I'm a bit biased in the sense that I think the future of reporting and communicating with results is web-based, you know, formats. Yeah. So I'm, of course, a huge fan of, you mentioned HTML widgets, being able to plug those in into like our markdown reports or the Shiny yeah. and communicate interesting insights or let users conduct their own analyses and play with that in the browsers so that they can easily not have you make like a bunch of static tables of like a different subset of a variable or a different look at a, a, a like a blind plot or something. So Yeah, yeah true. Uh, yeah, the main reason we support these different things is there's different specific use cases, but and they're, they're quite different. But the idea, at least the, the basic idea, is that if you write a statement in GT, like a set of statements, mm -hmm. it should, depending on your context, render the right thing. Um, okay. So the same statements should, uh, not always, depending on what you put in them, but uh, for the most part, they should work well for HTML, uh, RTF, and LaTeX uh, without much changing. So. Yeah, Very so good. the same same core principles apply to all three types. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, admittedly, I didn't hear about it until very recently, but I'm going to try it because in my industry, tables are one of the hardest things we have to deal with and yeah. translating results that we have to submit to, um, I'll just say, very influential people that yeah. are c accustomed to that format because the system processes are over stuff. So I'm, I'm very intrigued by, by where Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We've kept it kind of quiet on the sort of uh, PR front. We didn't, sure. uh, you might have noticed I didn't on Twitter like uh, announce it or anything like that. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's was, early yeah. days, as I said. Yeah, exactly, yeah. I don't want to draw yeah. too much attention to it. P people did find it, and that's great. People are using it. Um, <laughs> yeah. But it's still, like, it's still a little bit unstable. Uh, I wouldn't say experimental, but the mm -hmm. things are going to change is sure. what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I think if, if for those of us that are willing to kind of go through that exercise of perhaps a fluid environment, we want to make sure that it is performant enough and or that it has the language expressive enough for our needs. So I oh, think yeah. there will be yeah. a few of us that 
we'll take the plunge and yeah. uh, we'll, we'll uh, take the paper cuts along the way if need to. <laughs> but um, we want something, and I'll speak more on my work hat here, that we can quickly give those that are learning R, probably you know new, maybe they're coming from a legacy proprietary analysis language, I yeah. shall not name, but it is a difficult transition for them. But one thing that other framework does very well it has a very specific procedure for reporting results. And it's very yeah. customizable. They're very used to it. It is verbose, but it's also quite powerful. So I feel like yeah. GT could be a hook to augment some of that and let them express, you know, say, you know, grouped, grouped rows, nested headings, you know, yeah. like you said, footers, custom headers, and and be able to not have to worry about minutia about nitty gritty details. It sounds yeah. like you're trying for a, a nice clean interface to specify this. Absolutely, yeah. We don't want anybody to like deal with the, the nitty gritty of RTF at all. Yeah. Um, I mean, I mean, we may have hooks to that have some custom stuff in there, but it's mm -hmm. I, I kind of doubt it actually for RTF. Yeah, yeah. I, I hope so, <laughs> but. Um, but as long as it can be one of those things where it'll work great for RTF, and yeah, maybe it needs a few customizations here or there, but it also works equally well in HTML or other, other formats, I think you've, you've got a, that's a huge itch that needs to be scratched yeah. around here. So. Yeah, but what you're saying about HTML seems really exciting. Uh, like imagine yeah. being able to drop like a, a leaflet map inside a table cell or, oh, right. or yeah, any sort yeah. of HTML widget. It's treated as each cell as like a separate sort of like uh, canvas. Yeah, it's an it's entity important. that you yeah. can you know build any kind of output or representation. Yeah. I mean, stuff I've seen more recently is like spark lines, right? Yeah. Kind of like these histogram-like things in a cell. And exactly. So you can yeah. have data that is in a list column, for instance, yeah. and you can sort yeah. of uh, you can create with a formatter uh, these mm -hmm. spark lines. Uh, yep. It seems quite feasible and actually easy and pretty natural, mm -hmm. especially if you consider like um, like new dplyr functions like uh, nestby. We can, oh, sure. we can nest things and create list columns easily, and then operate on those and create those spark lines or anything. Any sort of like visualization requires on requires multiple bits of data. Yeah, in, in the short examples I saw at um, Ehue's workshop today, it looked like yeah. it was very tidyverse compliant, like it's friendly with a pipe. Or, but yeah, are you yeah. are you using those principles in mind when you build oh, the, the framework? Absolutely, yes. Okay, yeah, very uh, all cool. the way, hundred uh, percent. Same thing, like uh, like each part of the API, you know, the first. Uh, the first argument is the data. There you go. Yeah. So that, that's perfect. That's half the battle. Yeah. And uh, there's consistency principles in 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 tidy tool building is mm -hmm. consistency. So that's you know I, I'm borrowing quite a bit and and yep. I think it's uh, I think it's great to do so because it's pretty sound principles. Yeah. So I mean I know you're some pretty new to our studio, relatively new. Um, yeah. Had you been working with tidyverse or tidy related things before joining, or is this something you've been kind of learning on the fly? Uh, no, I've sort of? I've used the packages within mm -hmm. my own packages. Sure. So okay. uh, I yeah I've adopted that. I've used rlang for quite a long time as well. Oh, that's that's yeah. that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it, essentially, we could do things like in quote and and yep. you know quote and unquote inside mm -hmm. uh, packages I wrote as well. Um, yeah, and, and <laughs> rlang was pretty uns you know it's a it's experiment. I wouldn't say experimental, but things change like pretty quickly. So. It has been quite a fluid yeah, environment, but, but, and I've but, tried yeah. to learn it. I've been having a lot of stumbling blocks, but I'm yeah, yeah. yeah, it's it's even crazier when you when you uh, when you have it as an import in your in your package. So <laughs> things will change, and you have to you have to change things inside the package. But it's been great otherwise. Yeah. The benefits are far away far away the uh, uh, the you know the the changes you have to make to keep up with the package. But yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's been one of those things where I think it's it's a long term solution as it gets yeah. more stable. But um, it reminds me of the learning curve I had when I started learning Shiny because yeah. I don't know how much you've done with Shiny, but it's even though it's in R and it's all R functions, it's a different mindset sometimes. Oh, absolutely, to, yeah. To I, learn the effective use of that. Yeah, yeah, I have quite a, well, not quite a big experience, but you know, um, you know, some working experience with Shiny itself. I'm mm -hmm. actually in the Shiny team. Uh, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, okay. it is it's interesting, and and uh, it, it's just the way it is. Um, okay. Because, uh, well, I suppose the reason is uh, they wanted to have me in some sort of team, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> and it was close to publishing, so that, I think that was the rationale there, and it, it works out great because the. Uh, the my colleagues are fantastic in the Chinese group. Yeah, and yeah. Um, brilliant minds there. I've had a good fortune yeah. of collaborating with them on um, the, the talk I'll be giving at the end of the week. Actually, it's yeah. been, been a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, my previous work uh, before joining our studio, uh, I did make some shiny apps, and yeah, I get it. It's um, it's very slow development. Not slow development. It's a little hard 
it's very hard to make a sophisticated shiny app uh, starting from making it. <laughs> start, you start from a simple app, and then you uh, change yep. small things, yep. and then you keep checking that it works. Mm -hmm. and that was my workflow. Um, that's, that's I, I think that's, that's everybody's us. workflow. <laughs> a lot of us went through that, yeah. Yeah, no. misplaced comma equals lots of backtracking. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Print statements and cat statements for the win, as they say, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so that's interesting. I think, yeah, a lot of your skill set and what you've been doing previously are going to help nicely with some of the efforts they have going there. Yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's been great so far. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, so um, what are, I mean, of course, you're working on GT. Yeah. What are some other, you know, areas that you think in the community that, you know, are largely unsolved problems, whether it's in terms of visualization or, you know, reporting or anything like that? What, what are things that you're thinking of that would be nice to have some solutions for. Just yeah, like well, the other piece I was working on quite a bit was emailing. I know email, it's still a big thing, I think. Uh, people use it. Well, yeah, uh, <laughs> I, I, even though the technology is a bit of a dinosaur compared yeah. to other tech, it's not going away. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's pretty hard to do that in R. Um, yeah. Uh, to send email. I mean, there was a mail R package, uh, but it relied on some heavy you know, a Java dependency, which was not, not easy for everybody to install. Yeah, um, yeah. I think I've used a SendMail, I believe, on yeah. our, our Linux system at work. Yes. So I could automate an email if, like, a report was done. And just yeah, SendMail is a great yeah. uh, utility. It's, it's hard yeah. to have something that's cross-platform, though. Something that's that works true. It, was, it, it all worked the way on through. Linux, and I was, like, lucky. But, yeah, yeah. it's not going to work everywhere. Yeah, I, I looked yeah. through the entire landscape, and it's mm -hmm. really hard to find any sort of, like, one, any single project that works on all platforms. When, mm -hmm. I'm talking about Windows, Mac, and... Uh, uh, Linux. And yep. So, um, so I created my own. Uh, <laughs> I had a stab at it because I, I thought it'd be a fun little project uh, with a uh, package called Blastula. Blastula. Okay. Yeah, I think, I, think been, I'm, I think I'm pronouncing it wrong. Uh, I actually. Oh, really? Learned, <laughs> You're yeah. the one that made it. <laughs> well, I, yeah, that's that's a, that's a funny thing. It's actually a biological term. Uh, oh, it is. Oh, yeah, okay, okay. yeah. Okay. But it sounds like you know, like an email blast. So I thought it was kind of fun and nice, and you know, like have a Blastula or whatever. Oh, good, um, okay. You know, it sounds great. But I think it's like Blastula. I, is oh. is what I found out on the on the internet. It's oh, kind of strange. It's okay. a, a little bit disillusioning if you, <laughs> when you find out the thing you've been pronouncing so long, and so your own creation it has been wrong. Um, <laughs> but it happens. It happens to me all the time. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I made this package to try to send make email sending easier, and mm -hmm. uh, I thought just for fun, let's do it in HTML because uh, you know it's a little bit of a challenge. Like let's sure. have uh, let's have HTML emails, and let's uh, let's make it easy to do from every platform. Uh, apparently, it's not easy at all. Uh, you have to do things like sneak <laughs> binaries in there and have them yep. check the platform. It's uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it's something else. <laughs> yeah, most of you've learned I've learned some nooks and crannies about system dependencies. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, but I think it's it's working for most people um, okay. that use it. Um, it's worked for well for me. And the great thing is you can embed um, you know graphics, um, uh, GT tables. Uh, all right, there GG, you go. You know, GG plots. Um, so yeah, it's a great delivery tool for reports or anything uh, that you want to email. <laughs> well, the nice thing is we can just plug it into some other automated pipeline and yeah. have it. If you have the the fortune of a system like R Studio Connect or something like that, maybe it could be. Used yeah, to yeah, nice yeah. I was going to say R Studio Connect uh, sort of like took this and ran with it. Um, so mm -hmm. there's a partial integration with uh, with Blastula, at least creating the message body. Oh, okay. Uh, but they handle the sending, which is fantastic because well, the yeah, sending part is a hard part. Well, that's so, work for you then, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Okay. Yeah, so I don't have to worry about that part. But uh, the, e this, the email body part is uh, done in Blastula. And uh, yeah, it's really great. Um, you can integrate, it, basically, it's an HTML canvas uh, for, for emails. And uh, yeah, it's wonderful. Well, awesome. Yeah. Well, we'll put a, a link to that in the show notes so people can check it out. I'm, I'm giving it another look. I've seen it on GitHub. I haven't had a chance to put it for the paces yet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, well, Rich, it's been great to talk with you. Yeah. Um, if you want to give our listeners the best way to follow your work, uh, what, what, how could they contact you or at least see what you're yeah, up to? Yeah, uh, I've always been very open uh, through contact. Uh, check my GitHub page. It's uh -huh. uh, rich uh, dash Ian and my it's crazy, but my personal email is on there. <laughs> oh, wow. Whoa, there I know, I know. Again, personal. But <laughs> it's, it's on there. I'm also on Twitter as well yep. uh, under R-I-A-N-N-O-N-E. Um, been pretty quiet lately, but I hope to... Uh, <laughs> break out of my shell a bit oh, and yeah. get get back out there um that's kind of how i feel about this podcast yeah. actually yeah <laughs> <laughs> but yeah 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 reach out uh, email me uh, whatever yeah i'm i'm i like to talk 
Yeah, well, it's I mean, it's been awesome to meet you in real life. Uh, yeah. And um, definitely Likewise. look forward to uh, collaborating maybe in the future on some of your development. That would so be great. Yes. Be, um, be happy to be an early adopter to GT and then see what uh, <laughs> Blast you all can, can do for me in email yeah. reporting. Yeah. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to, to chat with me. And yeah, um, yeah we'll, we'll, we'll hang out, I'm sure, later in different venues. But, um, definitely, definitely. Awesome. So, everybody, um, we'll be right back. So that was extremely cool to, to meet Rich in real life. And again, you heard my admiration for his work with Diagrammer and now GT and some of the, and still, I'll, I'll say it again, the best looking documentation files I have ever seen. I don't know how he got those skills. I, I'll never get them, but <laughs> I can live vicariously through what he's done. Um, so what you didn't hear in that talk is um, Rich and I, talk quite a bit about GT because this is something that is going to be a huge benefit to my day job and lots of workflows in, in my industry. Table creation has been very difficult from the R side. And it's not like GT is the first solution to this. But I think the principles that Rich is outlining here are going to take this in directions that it needs to go to. So <clears throat> still early days, so to speak, but I think this has tons of potential and I'm going to put the put put it through the paces and try this out. But I, I think this is a space you definitely want to keep watching. So before I wrap up this episode, a couple of closing thoughts. First of which is I have kind of changed up my production workflow for the, the audio, you know, production of the show. If you find that it's not as good as it was before, just let me know. I'm, I'm trying a new service to kind of make the processing of everything a bit easier for me because real life doesn't give me all the time in the world that I had maybe in the early days of this to be as precise with processing as I could, could be now or could be before. So if you find it's not the right, the right quality, just let me know and I'll, I'll revise things. Um, second of all, a quick shout out to Hal Shu. Um, you heard me mention him as being one of the TAs at the Advanced R Markdown Workshop at the conference. Uh, really brilliant guy, fellow R Weekly team member. He, um, I, he has been designing some hex stickers lately, and one of them was for the package called Tiny Tech, which is by Ehway, um, to help facilitate the installation of LaTeX on your operating system of choice. Well, he designed this really awesome hex sticker for it, and I saw him tweet about it, and I was like, man, how does he do that? I wish I could be that creative. So I just kind of asked, you know, hey, this is really cool. What's your workflow for this? Little did I know that that very night he was going to do an awesome blog post about it. So if you've been wanting to learn about, you know, ideas for getting started making hex sticker designs, Check out that blog post, though. I'll have a link to it in the show notes. So, Hal, thank you so much for writing that because I am going to use that. I think it's time I start making some, I don't know what you call branding or some kind of design for this show. It may not be in our package, but why the heck not? Not so standard deviations has an awesome design. Why not me, right? So <laughs> try it out, see what happens. And even if it, I fail the first couple of times, at least I have some, some resource to go to at first. So... All right. Well, if you liked what you hear, um, you can definitely subscribe to the podcast. We are on the Apple Music Store, iTunes, or whatever it's called now. <laughs> um, of course, we're on many of the other podcasting software. We should be on Stitcher now. We should be on Pocket Cast if you're on Android. All, all the major players, we should be on there. Um, and if you want to get in touch with the show, the best place to do that is is head to the contact page at r-podcast.org slash contact. We have the handy dandy contact form there, as well as if you want detailed show notes from, from this episode, the easy URL is r-podcast.org slash 27. And don't hesitate to reach out on Twitter. I am at the rcast. And a funny little story behind this, I'm not sure if I mentioned it before, but I wanted our podcast for my Twitter handle. Unfortunately, that's been taken by somebody who hasn't posted in probably five years. So, whoops. <laughs> Maybe if it opens up again, I'll change it. But for now, it's at the RCast. And 
you can, yeah, again, head to the website for all the previous episodes as well. So that's going to wrap up episode 27. Thank you again so much for listening. And until next time. End of line.